Gerard Jerry Hutch, the notorious Irish criminal, advised his supporters to avoid the special criminal court as he awaited his fate. He anticipated being convicted for the murder of David Byrne, a drug dealer who was fatally shot at the Regency Hotel in 2016. But he held on to hope that an appeal might yield a favourable outcome. Hutch, a practical individual, prepared himself for the worst and harboured concerns about the possibility of dying behind bars. However, to his surprise, he was acquitted. The monk, as this Dublin gangster is known, now walks as a free man. Over the course of the past four decades, Hutch and his cohort of street-smart criminals have expanded their operations well beyond Dublin's north inner city. This criminal organisation associates with London gangsters, smugglers along the Costa del Sol, and modern iterations of the IRA. Defining the structure, strength and resilience of this gang proves challenging, as it lacks a hierarchical framework and instead operates as a loose collective of criminals bound by loyalty to a name, much like the Mafia. Their bonds have grown stronger since their feud with a rival cartel. These gangsters now pose a threat to Ireland's national security, having corrupted members of the Gardaí to shield themselves from prosecution and identify informants. Law enforcement officers fear that they are responsible for the most significant breach of intelligence in the force's history. At first glance, this may seem like another tale of organised crime prevailing against the law and emerging victorious. However, Hutch's acquittal at the Special Criminal Court, particularly the dramatic collapse of the case against him, will have lasting repercussions within legal and policing circles. This is the extraordinary account of how a man who appeared to be undeniably guilty managed to beat the system and miraculously evade a lifetime behind bars. Chapter 1. The Dream Team In February 2016, the assault on the Regency Hotel in Swords occurred, challenging the assumption that Hutch had retired from a life of crime. The main objective of this attack was to eliminate Daniel Kinahan, the leader of a rival drug cartel. The hutch Kinahan feud was reignited in September 2015, following the murder of Gary Hutch, the nephew of the monk, near Fuengarola on the Costa del Sol. Gary Hutch's killing came after an unsuccessful attempt on Kinahan's life again in Spain. The Hutch faction believed that the dispute had been resolved through the payment of €200,000 as compensation. They had even allowed Kinahan to shoot Patrick Hutch Jr. in the legs as a sign of respect. However, for criminals, murder serves as both a catalyst and a solution. As Kinahan continued to issue threats, the Hutches anticipated his next move. Their plan was straightforward. They would assassinate Kinahan, but make it appear as if the IRA were responsible. Hutch possessed a keen eye for talent and had a knack for recruiting individuals susceptible to corruption or willing to assist his gang. Jonathan Dowdell was a perfect fit for this role. Dowdell, a self-made entrepreneur who was not adverse to using force when necessary, had been acquainted with the Hutch family since his youth. Over time, he gained their trust and became a reliable associate, potentially involved in money laundering activities for the gang. When Dowdall successfully ran as a Sinn Féin representative for Dublin City Council, Hutch and his companions extended their support, aiding him in his political endeavours. Within the realm of organised crime, there coexists a network of violent factions, including dissident branches of the IRA. While some of these groups adhere to the IRA's historical use of violence to resist British presence in Northern Ireland, regardless of the backlash it may incite, they also engage in the targeted elimination of drug dealers for propaganda purposes. Occasionally, their interests align with those of criminal entities, creating a complex and interconnected ecosystem. Dowdall was sent into this world to recruit gunmen to assassinate Kinahan on behalf of the gang. He made several trips to Derry, Armagh and Donegal from early January 2015 in search of assistance. One of his contacts was Pierce McCauley, an IRA gunman who had previously killed a Garda and was serving a prison sentence for stabbing his wife, Sinn Féin TD Pauline Tully. 
Dowdle's efforts eventually led him to Kevin Murray, a paramilitary from Strabane in Derry. Murray and his associates in Derry already had a good relationship with the Hutch gang as they supplied them with illegal cigarettes and tobacco. Murray, who was short, stocky and dangerous, lived a secretive life. He presented himself as a staunch Republican who carried out punishment shootings against drug dealers as part of the vigilante group Republican Action Against Drugs. However, he also worked as an informant for the security services, providing them with information about his associates in exchange for payments. While detectives in Donegal handled him, both the police service of Northern Ireland and MI5 had also dealt with him. Initially, Murray helped compromise dissident plots and shared information about smuggling. However, the security services grew suspicious of him and eventually stopped trusting him. He was removed as a covert human intelligence source for the Garda after he refused to disengage from criminal activities. Nevertheless, officers continued to monitor him, and Murray continued to provide information to agents on both sides of the border. Once the assault team was assembled and Murray agreed to participate in exchange for payment, the murder plot progressed further. They aimed to make it appear as though a faction of the IRA was responsible for Kinahan's killing, knowing that it would confuse the cartel. To make the assaults appear authentic, someone suggested that one of the gang members should dress as a woman, as the IRA was known to employ female assassins, according to Republicans familiar with the events. The utilisation of AK-47 assault rifles, previously associated with the provisional IRA, and 9mm handguns would ultimately conclude the assault. The source of these weapons continues to be shrouded in mystery even today. Chapter 2 the attack. The attack, which was originally planned for February 5, encountered difficulties right from the start. At 2.30 p.m., the hit team arrived at the hotel's back gate in a Ford Transit van. Murray and another gunman disguised as a woman swiftly exited the vehicle and entered the building arm in arm, attempting to pass as a couple. Their destination was the ballroom where the boxing weigh-in was underway. It was there that they unleashed their gunfire. Amidst the chaos, Kinahan managed to escape through an emergency door with the duo hot on his heels. Fortunately for him, luck was on his side. He veered left while his pursuers turned right, losing sight of him. The sound of gunshots caused panic, prompting everyone to flee towards the hotel foyer. By the time the three remaining gunmen, disguised as Gardi, emerged from the van carrying AK-47s, Kinahan had already vanished. Byrne, who had rushed towards the entrance, fell victim to six gunshot wounds in the foyer when the gunman recognised him. The assault team searched fruitlessly for Kinahan, their frustrated voices echoing, he's gotten away. Kinahan's successful escape left the Hutch gang in a precarious position. In the cutthroat world of organised crime, they knew there would be consequences. Three days later, Hutch's brother Eddie was fatally shot in his residence in Dublin City. His murder marked only the beginning. Murray's ill-fated decision to be captured on camera fleeing the scene by a newspaper photographer proved to be his downfall. It took the Guider intelligence team a matter of days to identify him. Once they did, it led them to Dowdle, who in turn provided them with information about the Hutch gang. Dowdle's involvement also left behind a trail of evidence when he booked a hotel room for Murray on behalf of Patsy Hutch, the monk's brother. The resolution of the case did not occur in Dublin, but rather in Donegal, thanks to the efforts of the officers who were well acquainted with Murray and possessed extensive knowledge about him. This breakthrough proved to be crucial for Garda headquarters, especially considering the intelligence service's failure to identify the extent of the Hutch organization's criminal activities and prevent the attack, despite having abundant resources at their disposal. Following this development, all the suspects underwent thorough surveillance, with undercover detectives closely monitoring their every move. Additionally, informants were assigned to the task of providing valuable information. According to the Gardaí, Gerard Hutch appeared composed when he was observed in various locations in Dublin following the Regency attack. 
However, appearances can be deceiving, as the monk was actually in a state of intense panic. He privately hoped a Catholic bishop might mediate before he decided to approach the new IRA for help, believing only it could enforce a truce between the gangs. Chapter 3 – The SUV On December 20, 2016, Dowdle once again made a trip to Donegal, this time with the promise of delivering the assault rifles as an added incentive. At this point, the Garda intelligence had already been closely monitoring his activities and had planted a listening device in his SUV. The information gathered from this device revealed some shocking evidence, including conversations between Dowdle and Hutch as they drove to Strabane on March 7. During their chat, Hutch made a cryptic remark about throwing them up to them either way, referring indirectly to the assault rifles. He mentioned that even if they were to part ways and claim they wouldn't meet again, there would still be a gift, referring to the three weapons. The monk, in the conversation, explained his reasoning behind this plan. He mentioned that in 12 months' time, there would be two RUC men dead, and those weapons would be traced back to them ballistically. Dowdle concluded the discussion by saying that the blame would be placed on Republicans for the Regency incident. The two of them even joked about how the Gardi had no clue about what had actually transpired. During their journey, the two men initially travelled to Lisbon to meet an individual associated with the Continuity IRA. They then proceeded to meet a paramilitary named Shane Rowan in Strabane, who escorted them to a meeting with representatives of the new IRA's Army Council. Their purpose was to gather information about Murray, who had participated in the events either for personal gain or to settle a debt. The new IRA informed Hutch that they would not directly involve themselves, but would accept the firearms. This meeting unsettled Dowdle, causing him to become apprehensive about the potential consequences. Later that night, when Dowdle dropped Hutch off in Dublin, they agreed to hand over the weapons, unaware that the Gardaí were eavesdropping on their conversation. On March 9, the Garda intelligence observed Rowan and Patsy, Jared Hutch's brother, meeting in Kulok. Rowan's Vauxhall insignia had previously been taken to a yard where the three assault rifles were placed in the trunk. Several hours later, Rowan was apprehended in County Meath while driving north, with the guns in his possession. A search of his residence yielded ammunition and illegal cigarettes. Although he later pleaded guilty to IRA membership and possession of firearms, he did not serve his sentence alongside other Republican prisoners. Dowdle's arrest was prompted by the seizure, leading to a search of his residence on the Navan Road. The search was conducted based on suspicions that he may possess explosives. During a conversation with Hutch in his monitored SUV, Dowdle had discussed the use of explosives to target the Kinnahams. Although no firearms or explosives were found, a USB thumb drive containing a 10-minute video of Dowdle torturing and making threats to dismember a man piece by piece, and shaving his head with an electric razor was discovered. This video was recorded in January 2015, when Dowdle still held the position of a Sinn Féin councillor. Similar to Rowan, Dowdle was subsequently sentenced to prison. Chapter 4 – Infiltration and Betrayal The investigation into the Regency attack uncovered a startling revelation the Hutch organization had transformed from a local gang into a formidable and enterprising entity, although its existence remained largely unknown. Disturbing intelligence indicated that it had infiltrated the Gardaí, causing rumours to circulate after the case against Patrick Hutch Jr. collapsed. He had been accused of being the gunman disguised as a woman, but the senior Garda leading the case tragically took his own life. However, the first signs of corruption emerged in April 2021 when a European warrant was issued for Hutch's arrest in connection with Burns murder. This caused great concern among the Irish and Spanish security services when the details of the warrant were shared on the Gardaí's IT system, and Hutch, who had a flight scheduled from Malaga to Lanzarote, suddenly vanished. The disappearance triggered a covert investigation that eventually links the gang to a retired detective superintendent named John Murphy. 
Surveillance operations revealed that Murphy was divulging confidential information to Thomas Savage, a convicted drug trafficker from Swords, who in turn passed it on to the Hutch gang. The discovery proved to be a catastrophic blow for Garda headquarters, as the extent of the infiltration became apparent. Murray wasn't just providing information, he was also orchestrating the gang's counterintelligence efforts. He would enlist former Garda colleagues to conduct checks on individuals, vehicles and addresses associated with the Hutch gang in order to determine if they were under surveillance. This unconventional yet effective form of counter-surveillance raised suspicions among many officers who began to believe that the gang had been tipped off about the absence of surveillance on Kinahan during the Regency raid. The discovery of Murphy as an undercover agent expedited the search for Hutch, resulting in his eventual apprehension in August 2021 at a cafe in Fuengarola by Spanish authorities. This arrest came as a shock to the criminal gang, as they had believed that Murphy would be notified if the Garda headquarters discovered Hutch's location. Shortly after being informed of the arrest, Savage tragically passed away from a heart attack. Murray, on the other hand, was arrested a few days later for drug-related offences and subsequently incarcerated. Dowdle was approaching the conclusion of his sentence for false imprisonment when he, along with Paul Murphy and Jason Bonney, both Dubliners who served as getaway drivers for the Regency assault team, was charged with Burns' murder. However, Dowdle now desired to be released. He reached out to the Gardaí, but there were initial concerns. Some individuals within the intelligence community suspected that he might be a double agent following orders from Hutch. Despite Dowdle's denial of any knowledge regarding the Regency plan, these earlier warnings were disregarded, according to multiple sources. He fabricated a story to distance himself from Hutch, organised crime and the Regency. Just ten days before the Regency trial was scheduled to commence, Dowdle agreed to provide a statement against Hutch. Hutch became aware of this development after being arrested during an ongoing investigation into Murphy. As part of the agreement, Dowdle pleaded guilty to a lesser charge of facilitating Burns' murder. To avoid potential legal complications and to protect intelligence gathering operations against the broader Hutch group and dissidents, the state did not charge Hutch with possession or control of the firearms. The moment Dowdle took the stand, the battle lines were drawn. At every opportunity he chose to deceive, denying any involvement in organised crime while conveniently omitting his past conviction for torture and false imprisonment. Even when faced with undeniable evidence, Dowdle continued to fabricate his responses. When asked about his visits to Macaulay in prison, he claimed to have gone two or three times, despite prison records revealing multiple dates. Hutch, on the other hand, fought tooth and nail to have his trial heard by a jury at the Supreme Court, rather than the Special Criminal Court. However, it was the three judges at the non-jury court who ultimately delivered justice. In a strange twist of fate, Dowdle inadvertently aided Hutch's defence. Justice Tara Burns, in delivering the verdict, outlined the reasons behind the decision. She highlighted that Dowdle's actions were driven by self-interest and deceit, rather than a genuine change of heart. Furthermore, the audio recordings of Hutch and Dowdle were far from conclusive. Although Hutch made references to the Regency, the feud and guns, they did not prove his presence at the scene. It was even suggested that Patsy Hutch may have orchestrated the raid. Based on the evidence presented, Justice Burns concluded that there was a reasonable possibility that Patsy Hutch planned the Regency, with Gerard Hutch stepping in afterward to handle the aftermath. With this, she delivered a not guilty verdict. However, the story is far from over for Hutch, as he remains a target for the Kinahan cartel. Having survived previous attempts on his life, it is likely that they will try again. Additionally, Murray, who discovered his diagnosis of motor neurone disease after the Regency attack, tragically passed away in August 2017. As for Dowdle, upon his release from prison, he will embark on a new life under a new identity within the Witness Protection Scheme, and it is safe to say he will forever be looking over his shoulder.